Parables of the Messiah by Brother John Carter Parables of the Messiah number 58 The Sheep and the Goats Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46 The last portion of Matthew 25 is not strictly a parable, although it is so regarded by some. It contains the figures of sheep and goats, and perhaps there are other of Christ's words which have a meaning besides the literal. But with these qualifications it is a description of the judgment when Christ comes. If it is a parable, we must interpret the various parts of it as having to do with some plane of thought other than the one described. In the two parables related earlier in the chapter, the virgins are representative of others who, on the spiritual plane, correspond to them. The trading of the servants is not in the marketplace or other commercial business, but represents other forms of service for Christ. One writer who treats the judgment picture as a parable boldly and consistently regards the royal throne and the nations gathered for judgment as a metaphorical picture of spiritual reality in terms of human life. In that case, we should not interpret the visiting of sick and needy in a literal way, but should seek for the spiritual correspondence. Many think that the words of Jesus now under consideration indicate the sole essentials for acceptance in the day of judgment. But this view sets aside much that Jesus taught as important in relation to that judgment. It also disregards much more in the epistles which, with the authority of inspiration, sets forth certain aspects of responsibility to reveal the truth that could not be included in the teaching of Jesus when he preached. The qualities of watchfulness and faithfulness shown in the two parables preceding as conditions of approval by Christ at his return also prove that such a construction is altogether too narrow. In fact, were we to confine our views to these verses of what the Lord will approve in the day of judgment, we should have to conclude that kindness to needy brethren will be enough to gain Christ's blessing. A person could be guilty of many sins of body and spirit, and yet, by almsgiving, ensure that he would enter into life. A further objection to such a restricted view is that in the last issue salvation would be dependent on merit, even though unrecognized by the meritorious. We need not discuss the many interpretations that a false theology has imposed upon the parable, nor the difficulties connected with everlasting fire which the doctrine of the immortality of the soul entails. There are also some positive truths concerning both the Lord and those who are His, upon which extended commitment could be made, but which do not come within a study of parables. It might be noted, however, with what sublimity Jesus pictures the future when he knew he was within a few days of shame and death. He could speak with confidence even then of the Son of Man coming in glory with angels attending. In the day when he was crowned with thorns, there were legions of angels ready to answer his call. But that was the day of shame, and such help he refused to accept. The throne of his glory yet to be established is the throne of David to which he is heir. Occupation of that throne was not a source of glory to all who succeeded David, neither did all bring glory to it. But it is affirmed of Messiah that he shall be for a glorious throne to his Father's house, 
Isaiah 22, verse 23. A statement that indicates Messiah's divine sonship and the fact that he brings the glory to the throne. In Matthew 25, verse 34, Jesus speaks of those, Blessed of my Father. All nations gathered before him does not primarily mean a judgment upon all nations, although in a secondary sense of the parable it might be so applied, as Dr. Thomas did. The language of Jesus recalls that of Joel, which is a judgment of nations, Joel 3, 11 and 12. The phrase, all nations, in the context of the parable, stands in contrast to Jewish exclusiveness. The Jews thought of salvation as limited to Israel. But Jesus, who had on more than one occasion declared that many Gentiles should come from all four corners of the world to sit down with Abraham in the kingdom of God, thinks of men out of every race as assembled before him in this judgment scene. He said he would draw all men unto him, all without a distinction of race. Having been drawn by the knowledge of the gospel, men will be called to the judgment seat of Christ. Why should the figure of sheep and goats be used for the accepted and rejected? There may be two reasons based upon the habits and colour of the animals. Sheep are usually white and goats black, the significance of which is clear. Additionally, sheep are inoffensive while goats are mischievous. Tristram says, This constant browsing of goats on the tender twigs and the foliage of the thymes and dwarf shrubs is one of the causes which has prevented the restoration of the forests even in the most deserted parts of the Holy Land. Indeed, they have extirpated many species of trees which once covered the hills. Though the goats mingle with the sheep, there is no disposition on either side for more intimate acquaintance. When folded together at night, they may be always seen gathered in distinctive groups, and round the wells they appear instinctively to classify themselves apart. The general differences between sheep and goats have been noted by many writers. Two ancient authors, one Roman and the other Greek, have been cited as follows. You may often see herds of goats and flocks of sheep mingled at pasture, but easily divided again by the herdsmen. Sheep, whether black or white, betoken good by reason of their qualities of obedience and fellowship in flocks, but goats bode evil, being solitary and disobedient. Ezekiel has a parable of sheep, which must often have been in the mind of Jesus, when he opposed the rulers of his day. The prophet saw in vision Israel as sheep scattered and without shepherd. As Jesus saw them in his experience, when he was moved with compassion for them. Mark 6, verse 34. God used the phrase, My sheep, even as Jesus also did. God said he would judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he-goats. The parable is not exact, for God is indicating the leaders, the rams and the he-goats. Compare Isaiah 14, verse 9, margin not judging between goats and sheep. Yet the objects in view are the same, although the use of the figure is rather different. In the literary construction of the parable, there is a frequent use of parallelism which adds to its impressiveness. One consequence of the relationship that exists between Jesus and his brethren is well illustrated in this judgment scene. I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat, the judge says. When those to whom he speaks ask in surprise when they saw him hungry, he answers, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. 
Christ is the head of the body, and he identifies himself with all the members of the body. When Saul was persecuting the followers of Jesus, and the risen Lord appeared to him, Saul was not asked, Why persecutest thou my followers? But, Why persecutest thou me? We are buried with Christ by baptism into his death. Our old man is crucified with him. With greater personal emphasis and vividness of figure, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. He is our representative when we in baptism make him so, by identifying ourselves with him in his death thereby in symbol acknowledging God's righteousness in imposing death for sin, a righteousness which was upheld by Jesus in his voluntary death. It is at first a surprising but then a comforting thought that the Lord so closely unites himself with those who are his, both in their suffering and in their needs, that he regards a kindness done to his people as done to himself. The things commended in the parable are restricted to acts of mercy towards those in bodily need or suffering. It would have been inappropriate for the judge to have identified himself with his followers in any more extensive way than this. He both hungered and was thirsty. He was in prison. But he never erred from God's ways. He did no sin, no guile was found in his mouth. Those who are his without exception do one or other of these things, and all without exception are at some time sick of soul and weary in the way. To feed a sick soul may have greater value than feeding a hungry body. To help the spiritually weary may fill a greater need than restoring physical vigour. The kindnesses which are mentioned in the parable then are such only as the Lord could fittingly include and at the same time identify himself with his followers in the actions and are therefore representative of the much wider range of activity which includes service in spiritual things of equal or even greater importance than physical blessing. In fact, Jesus himself laid greater emphasis upon the spiritual needs of those who sought him than on needs of the body. Loaves and fishes took second place to working the works of God. John 6 verse 26 to 29 one of these my brethren, so he will recognize the accepted. Disciples, children, friends, all these words he used to describe his faithful followers, but my brethren takes hold of the king's pronouncement, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Psalm 22 verse 22, which when Paul quotes it, is found to be indicative of Christ's pleasure in them, for, says Paul, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Hebrews 2 verse 11 The Lord takes up the idea of the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels in his own last message through the beloved disciple. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that were wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Revelation 19 verse 20 A comparison of Revelation 12 verse 9, 13 verse 1 and 11, 20 verse 2 and 10, with the verses quoted, will show that under the symbols of beast, dragon, devil, old serpent, Satan, the sin power of the flesh in corporate manifestation, in royal and priestly powers, is indicated. This guides us to the meaning of Jesus. His work of subjugation of the world will take time. 
The resistance will be fierce, for papal leaders, the false prophet of Revelation 19 verse 20, will denounce the Lord as Antichrist. Raging nations will only learn by judgment, Isaiah 26 verse 21, and angry nations will know the anger of God, Revelation 11 verse 18. If then, with the knowledge they will have of the true facts of the situation, the rejected of Christ are driven forth to take their part in that lake of fire, the circumstances of the punishment will have some correspondence with their own refusal to render obedience to the Lord.